Half a day, the Committee on um, Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice is now called to order. Today is Tuesday, October 20, 2020. The time is 12.31 p.m. Notices for this virtual public hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Tuesday, October 13, and again on Sunday, October 18, 2020. And the notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Tuesday, October 13, and Sunday, October 18, 2020. This Zoom meeting is hosted by the legislature's MIS staff, and I thank them for their assistance. And the host of this hearing will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and begin by stating their name for record keeping purposes. We have two uh, items for 1230 uh, on our agenda. There are two bills, bill number 382-35 COR introduced by Senator Louise B. Munya is an act to add a new section 19406 to article four, chapter 19, title 10, Guam code annotated relative to creating the pandemic bill of rights. Then we will hear bill number 399 COR introduced by Senator William M. Castro, an act to add a new section 1903A7 and add a new 19406 of article four, chapter 19, title 10, Guam code annotated relative to the renewal of declarations of public health emergencies. We will recess after the hearing on these two bills and reconvene at 4.30 for a round table on pre-hospital isolation and care for COVID-19 positive individuals. I'd like to first acknowledge the presence of my colleagues. Thank you colleagues for being here. Sen uh, Senate, sorry. Beginning, of course, with uh, Senator William Castro, Senator Luis Munya, Senator Kelly Marsh Taitano, Senator Mary Camacho Torres, our Minority Leader, Senator Tello Taitagui, and our um, Committee on Rules Chair, Senator Regine Bisco Lee. Okay. We are also honored today to have very distinguished guests on our panel, including uh, our Congressman, uh, Representative Michael. L St. Nicholas, and our um, Archbishop, Michael J. Burns, our uh, former Congressman, Robert Underwood, and, um, and many others. Sijus Masi for being here. All right, so we will begin with the hearing on bill number 382-35. And I would invite the sponsor, Senator Luis Munoz, to introduce the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I have to say at first that uh, this is probably a stage that I've stepped on unlike any other in my entire career. Um, so I just thank you for allowing um, you know everyone to come in and testify. And, and I have to say no disrespect to anybody else on here, but I'm a little bit starstruck and a little bit nervous to speak in front of the Archbishop. So uh, please bear with me. <laughs> I feel like God is watching. <laughs> So, uh, Madam Speaker, as you said, this is uh, Bill Number 382-35 uh, is an act to add a new subsection 19406 to Article 4, Chapter 19, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, relative to creating the Pandemic Bill of Rights. And uh, just for formality, I'll read my testimony and then just go off a little bit uh, on my own personal uh, feelings as well, too. There will always be a debate on how far government can impose its wills to protect whom they govern. There is an ongoing debate right now between the left and right and liberals and conservatives and Democrats and Republicans. I mean, you see it all the time in the media. This bill will not be, it will not be settled by this bill it, or the legislature or even the governor. This bill does not target anyone, but rather it is intended to reiterate our constitutional and organic rights as they apply to pandemics. The bill is, is solely dedicated to the protection of our constitutional and organic rights. These alien, inalienable rights include the freedom of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, the right to just compensation, 
the right to due process, the right of equal protection and protection from excessive fines and cruel and unusual punishment. Here's what the problems that, that we are, are having now with Guam's public health emergency laws that permit the government to deny fundamental civil rights. The government can close our churches instead of providing assistance and guidance to let them safely operate. The government can close down firearm registrations and firearm ID issuance that infringes on the rights of law abiding citizens to keep and bear arms. The government can seize your shipment of face mask and reimburse you not at your cost or the place replacement cost, but at the production cost. Imagine being reimbursed at the cost of paying workers in China $5 per day for labor. They will never be able to determine the production cost, so these people will likely never be reimbursed. The government can seize your shipment of medicine that was prescribed for you and that you paid for, and then give it to whomever they please. Now, imagine them taking, for example, your lupus medication and, and use it on a COVID patient. The government can convict you of cr criminal acts like felonies and misdemeanors for things that are not in violation, that are not violation of our criminal co code. For example, this year, one can be convicted of a misdemeanor for not wearing a mask when entering a business. Now, last year, if we walked into a bank wearing a mask, we'd probably look, be looking at, I don't know, five to 20 years. It's a whole different ballgame. The government can create or redefine crimes without enactment into law. It doesn't matter that courts have consistently ruled that, that only the legislative branch of government can create crimes or redefine crimes, and that the legislature cannot delegate this authority to create crimes to another branch of government. We have seen executive orders that attempt to rewrite the elements of the civil violation of public nuisance and the crime of criminal mischief, which may carry a felony conviction. Now, I know that this, this bill does not address the issue of forced closures of businesses. Perhaps, maybe in the future, we can lobby for amendments to our Constitution and Organic Act that make the right to operate a business, a fundamental civil right. Now the term business, the term business privilege in, in business privilege tax kind of disturbs me. And I hope maybe that the next legislature will change the name back to gross receipts tax, which is the term used throughout the United States and is defined in generally accepted accounting principles. Now, do we need this bill to protect our constitutional rights? Probably not. We needed to let our future governors uh, in future emergency declarations that our constitutional and organic rights must not be suspended in those declarations. Now, Madam Chair, I hope that we report this bill out. The people deserve the protection of the law that will be enacted by this bill. They should not have to incur the time costs of lawsuits to protect their fundamental constitutional and organic rights. And I must remind all of our colleagues here today and all of the elected leaders what we did when we first took office. We put our hand on that Bible, we raised our right hand, and we took an oath of office to protect and faithfully, in our own will, protect the constitutional constitution of the United States of America and the laws that abide by Guam. So I must remind us that we all took an oath to that office to protect the constitution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Munya. I'd also like to recognize the presence, the presence, sorry, of my colleagues, Senator uh, Sabina Paris, who is the vice chairman of this committee, and Senator James Moylan. Thank you, senators. And uh, we will begin now with those who signed up to testify, beginning with our former colleague, uh, former senator, and current congressman, uh, Representative Michael Sinicolis. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, before I begin, uh, if um, uh, our Archbishop has signed up for um, uh, testimony, I would like to respectfully defer to him if the committee will oblige. Thank you. Uh, that would very much be appreciated. Um, Archbishop, if you are ready to testify, we would like to recognize you, uh, Archbishop Michael J. Burns, Metropolitan Archbishop of Agatha. 
Well, half a day, Madam Chairperson, Senator Tulahi and Senators Munya and Castro and other distinguished members of the uh, 35th Guam Legislature. Uh, I would like to testify in support of uh, this bill. I don't have all the language to identify that bill, but uh, the, uh, the concern that I share, um, perhaps obviously, is the exercise, the free exercise of religion. And when I say that, I don't mean just the Catholic Church, pretty much every Christian church um, on the island uh, is concerned about the exercise of free religion. When you talk about the exercise of free religion, it goes more than just the church, being in church. Uh, we exercise religion yeah, through every uh, parish pantry for the homeless, for every ministry to the homeless, for social uh, housing for the homeless, for uh, any number of social uh, ills. Um, the, uh, the Christian church, the Catholic church uh, is involved. And so for us to uh, be limited in, uh, in any way for, uh, you know, forming uh, or contributing to a, uh, as a, a function of, you know, that it is uh, trying to reduce the amount of domestic violence going on in, in our island. Um, anything like that is really, it's, uh, it's, breaking into or changing religion and our exercise of religion. And of course, the, for the Christian church, uh, Sunday's our day. And to find ourselves uh, so, you know, so grievously limited to almost not allowing anybody into the church, um, that's a problem for us. And at the same time, we as the, certainly as the Catholic Church, um, we recognize that we have an obligation to uh, collaborate with the, uh, the state. You know, the relationship between church and state has been going back and forth uh, for some many decades. And from, from my point of view, what we as the Catholic Church want to do is, is to partner with government. Um, as long as the, the government is uh, amenable to the way that we do exercise uh, our, religi our religion, and especially for Sundays. I think right when the uh, pandemic began, um, the Catholic Church was involved through Polly Mike and Father Ron Richards to be part of the pandemic response plan team. And that's, it's, it's, it, we're, we're dedicated to this, you know, we're, we're part of this. And partners should be in good communication before things just change uh, before us. Um, we have, uh, proven ourselves in the Catholic Church that we do Sundays really well. We, we follow all the protocols that uh, for social distancing, um, nobody walks into our churches without a temperature check. Um, we uh, sanitize um, so much like, you know, I have to sanitize my hand every single time I give communion to somebody. Um, and so as partners, we should be able to push back at times too. That, you know, if, if something's becoming uh, a little, uh, a greater weight on us um, as the church, um, we're gonna, you know, we may push back at times uh, because that's what partners do. All in all, I say, I'm, I'm really grateful for the uh, efforts of, uh, you, Madam Chairperson, and the uh, senators here, um, 
to make a, give us a greater clarity of how do we operate in the midst of a pandemic and how do we operate in, in a situation where the, uh, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of uh, angst, and um, I think you're bringing some really good uh, rational uh, sentiment into uh, the conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Archbishop. Uh, I will now recognize the Congressman Sir Nicholas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for convening this, this public hearing on this very important bill. I want to begin by uh, acknowledging the public health concern um, that has been, of course, with us over the past going on eight months now and uh, is recently showing uh, just how how prevalent it is in our community and, it, and is uh, you know, striking a lot of fear into the hearts of, of our people. I think that, of course, we need to um, stay vigilant and address the public health concern. However, I wanted to um, uh, present to the committee uh, and, the, and the senators with some facts that we are aware of um, that I think need to be taken into consideration as we begin to look forward. First, um, we, we have um, a lot of expectation for a vaccine. Um, I know that um, the, the entire world is waiting for one. I know that the nation is very much waiting for one. And I know that our community is very much waiting for one. Um, it's important for us to be very, very clear about what the expectations of vaccination uh, should be. And uh, this is information that's been shared with me um, directly uh, with um, uh, experts in um, the CDC and the National Institute of Health. As a matter of fact, I was just on a, uh, on a conference call with um, some of my colleagues at 4 a.m. this morning, um, just getting the latest information on, um, on relief um, movement, as well as the, uh, the um, pandemic circumstances. Right now, the um, vaccination expectations have, um, have some issues. And um, the reason why this conversation is, is not being um, um, highlighted uh, a lot is because we do want to encourage vaccination. There is a, uh, in the country, not, not on Guam, but in the country, there are about 30 to 40% of the public that still does not believe that the pandemic is real. That's very problematic because we can expect that those numbers will not be seeking vaccination. On top of that, 50% um, of those who do believe the pandemic is real, only 50% are expressing that they will seek vaccination. So there are those who don't believe the pandemic is real. There are those that do, but are, are um, hesitant to seek vaccination because of the, um, the rate at which it's being developed and concerns that it might, uh, it might not present um, all of the risks given the uh, abbreviated development timeline. So nationally, we're looking at maybe a third of the country getting vaccinated. And as we've come to know over the discussions of herd immunity and the need for, for um, a certain level of, of vaccine to be um, you know, distributed throughout the community, um, even just 30% of the country getting vaccinated would not be enough to make COVID-19 go away. And so those are things that we need to overcome perceptually. Uh, there are also some other perceptions related to the vaccine that we need to um, be very, very aware of. Based on um, CDC and vaccine development experts, the efficacy of the vaccine that's being created um, has, uh, uh, has some variations. Um, it could be as low as only 50% effective. It could be as high as only 75% effective. And that's important to understand because the um, perception in, in, the, in the country, and I think the perception locally, is that the vaccine that we are anticipating is going to be something similar to the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella with a 97% efficacy rate. That is not what is being projected at this time in the development of this current uh, round of vaccines. The global availability of the vaccine uh, the ab ability for the entire world to be able to avail of this will not be until 2024, given vaccine manufacturing capacities, the need to ma manufacture other vaccines, 
um, and the and the demand and the uh, total amount of population that would would need to receive it. Altogether, given these facts, there is a perception, I think, on the island that once a vaccine becomes available, once it becomes distributed, we're going to be able to turn everything back on and return to normal within 30, 60, 90 days. The reality, given these facts that I've shared, is that that is not going to be the case. COVID-19 is going to be with us for, for quite a while. And in light of that, we not only need to be incredibly mindful of the public health concern and continue to address it, we need to also be very mindful of the need for us to rebalance our approach so that we are not being kept in these circumstances that over the duration is going to be unsustainable. If we're looking at 2024 for a global vaccination rate, um, we, we need to be very upfront that our tourism markets, particularly because they are health sensitive, may not be interested in traveling until such time that there is a global declaration that COVID-19 has been defeated. But given these facts that I've shared, that is not something that is very likely to come in the near future. And so as we weigh these facts, we need to immediately begin readying our circumstances so that our people are going to be able to continue to sustain themselves um, as relief packages uh, become exhausted. Right now, we've, um, we've moved the CARES Act um, that's provided um, tracking to be 1.5, 1.6 billion in relief to our people. Um, our language in the HEROES Act is projecting to bring in over 3 billion for our people if we're able to get that through. The political realities of that are, are uncertain at this time. There's just been a lot of back and forth on that. Um, and then the outcome of the um, elections on the 3rd of November are going to have a serious um, impact on whether or not that's going to move forward. So we are definitely included in the language, but the ability to secure those resources remains uncertain. And even if we do, those relief packages likely will carry us um, into 2021 and perhaps a little bit into fiscal year 2022. But again, given the vaccine timelines, the efficacy, the, uh, the uh, general public's uh, communication of their willingness to, um, to receive it, even, even that relief may not be enough to carry us as far as we need to go to overcome uh, the virus and return to um, a, a general state of normalcy. That being said, um, I, I believe that this legislation that we're discussing here today is absolutely a step in the right direction towards um, very mindfully rebalancing our approach. I believe that we absolutely need to uh, continue to press the public health concern. Um, I, I definitely want to um, uh, recognize the Archdiocese uh, recently with um, the passing of Monsignor. I, I, I observed firsthand the, um, the very, very uh, disciplined approach that they are taking to uh, manage um, uh, community spread and to make sure that that's not going to be a concern in our churches. Um, that, needs to be, um, that needs to be definitely mirrored in our private sector as well as in our government. Part of the problem as well with the current approach is when we have these hot or cold um, uh, approaches on how we're dealing with trying to um, contain the virus, when you shut everything down, a reality that I think needs to be um, very clearly understood is that you pent up demand. You make everybody stay home and you make everybody have to wait before they're able to go out and do what they need to do. And so when we go hot and we go cold, um, when you unleash that pent up demand by opening things back up again, that's why we see long lines at Ross. That's why we see a lot of people going out and flooding establishments that were previously closed because the demand was pent up. If we have a more um, systematic um, approach on how things open and close, and we don't create these demand uh, circumstances, then we can have, um, similar to what our churches are employing, a very regimented um, uh, procedure. I, I, I've been concerned, um, and I'm sure others have been concerned, 
uh, where we see certain businesses almost completely um, flouting um, the public health concern. And, and so we're creating, we're creating a circumstance where people are feeling like it's all or nothing, you know, open everything up or shut everything down. And both are going to be incredibly devastating, not only in the immediate term, but over the long term. And so I appreciate this legislation. I support it. I believe that it moves us more towards a balanced approach on how to address the public health concern, as well as the, uh, the quality of life uh, issues that, that we're, we're also dealing with uh, on a wholesale basis. Um, I think that uh, we, we need to take these facts that I've shared and uh, seriously digest them. And as a community, um, and definitely in the positions of leadership that we hold, uh, provide the guidance to the public for us to um, take the necessary actions to not only stay vigilant and very, very disciplined in the public health aspect, but to also be able to do so on a sustainable basis, not create these pressure cooker type of situations that are actually, I think, exacerbating the, um, the, uh, the viral spread and, uh, and, and bring in bring in the communities that we have a partnership approach um, rather than you know a, a an approach where it's all or nothing and and things just become a lot more polarized and demand becomes a lot more um, built up and then when the pressure valve is released a little bit it just actually exacerbates the uh, the circumstances so I thank um, I thank the senator for uh, taking the necessary step I know it's very difficult this is not easy you know there's a lot of fear out there. And the concern is that any kind of approach that tries to seek a more balanced um, view, uh, it could easily be portrayed as um, being um, negligent to, to life and negligent to health. And I don't think that that's at all the case here. Um, I think that we as leaders need to um, communicate uh, in a unified way that there is a way for us to move forward in a balanced fashion and um, I'd like to credit the Senator for introducing this and taking that, that risk. And I think that this is perhaps a, an opportunity for us to start a very important community conversation about the need for rebalancing, but also the need to take the public health concerns seriously as we do so. Thank you so much, Madam Chairman. And, and I was gonna say I yield back, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, and welcome back. And uh, we will wait for public health to re come back on when we will hear right now from Congressman, uh, former Congressman Robert Underwood. Good day. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, I won't go on and on about what I think should be done with the pandemic. And uh, I do thank the previous speaker for actually clarifying the actual status of this uh, second round of pandemic relief. Uh, uh, we have been treated in the past to sort of a flowery picture about what's going to happen. Now we have a more sobering and more realistic picture. I would add that I think it is incumbent upon any political leader to spare no effort uh, to seek uh, not only the vaccine, but to help educate the community about vaccine and help educate the community about where we're at with our public health situation. And indeed, this is not the beginning of the discussion. This is way, oh, way, we're way from the beginning. We are uh, on, this is an ongoing conversation in which all leaders should have been in participation over the past few months. I want to thank uh, Senator Munya for her legislation. It's an interesting piece of legislation and I'll try to confine my comments to the actual hearing on the legislation, which I think is designed more to make a statement about our current state of affairs rather than to enact specific legislation uh, to uh, protect constitutional provisions, which I believe remain fully intact. The constitutional amendments as they apply to Guam are clearly in order. If they're not, they can be challenged in court and decided in accordance with case law, which is extensive on all these issues uh, regarding the scope of power a government has over matters of public health and safety. Every single amendment that is referred to in this legislation uh, is available to every citizen to litigate 
if they if any of these amendments are really in danger of being crossed by uh, local governmental action. The bill uses Attorney General Bill Barr as a source to reflect a concern, uh, although not necessarily legal guidance, that some government actions to deal with the pandemic may be testing the limits of the Constitution. Expressing a concern is different from taking legal action. The, the Attorney General, Attorney General Barr, has the official standing and resources to challenge any state or territorial action. While many people are clear in their disagreement with the decisions of the authorities over the nature of when, how, and for how long to shut down various activities in our community, it is not that clear that any constitutional rights are really at stake. Using Bill Barr as a source for these disagreements is misplaced. In response to some lockdown orders given by state and local governments earlier this year, he said that these orders were the greatest intrusion on civil liberties since slavery. While some may feel the attempt to save lives by government officials uh, in ordering lockdowns may be inappropriate or even harmful, the comparison to slavery is odious. Making a comparison of an attempt to save human lives to human bondage and servitude is clearly inappropriate. Moreover, other than making these comments and generating controversy, the Department of Justice has not really taken any legal action to deal with the so this so-called intrusion on civil liberties. Most constitutional scholars concede that First Amendment rights, including freedom of religion, are not absolute. Authorities can and do regulate the manner in which these freedoms are exercised through their police authority, such as when gatherings can occur and under what circumstances. These are regulated through issuance of permits and regulations, permits for protests, regulations for public safety and for public uh, uh, health. While some individual exercises of this authority have been successfully challenged, the idea of police authority has not been. I want to congratulate the Archbishop and indeed all the members of the communities of faith here on island for their impassion and sincere service to try to help the community as a whole get over this pandemic and deal with all the pressures that occur as a result of life and home and having to deal with uh, different ways of conducting worship services. In the case of church services, I think I, I am sympathetic to uh, the Archbishop and other members of the community, uh, faith community trying to organize uh, church services. That their concern is that local authorities have vacillated about under what circumstances services can occur. This kind of decision-making makes it difficult to have full confidence in the exercise of police authority, but the vacillations themselves do not constitute a constitutional threat. In a case involving a Nevada church earlier this year, the US Supreme Court ruled that states may regulate attendance at churches. There is the serious concern as to whether churches are being forced to follow different rules from other public gatherings. Again, this is a matter of consistency and implementation of the state's right to regulate attendance in the name of public health, rather than the right to regulate itself. I'm also reminded of, the, of a quote from the Bible, from Peter chapter two, verse 13. For the Lord's sake, Obey every law of your government. It is up to us to challenge those in authority when we disagree, and we should hold them to that account. And I congratulate the chair and other members of this committee who tried to do that. I support these efforts, and we should feel free to question these decisions. But to raise it to a level of constitutionality becomes more of a statement of concern rather than real legislation. Now, there is one piece in here that is real legislation. 
changing the violation of these rules from misdemeanor to civil violation is real legislation. This reduces the penalty for violation of the rules as promulgated by the government of Guam through executive order. In as much as to my, uh, uh, no one has really been charged with anything to my knowledge, this doesn't appear to change many things. However, I do agree that civil violation may be more appropriate since it will not show up as a criminal charge. However, multiple civil violations must eventually show up as something, as uh, a form of criminally uh, willful behavior. I hope that we never reach that point. In spite of the disagreements of the, over the extent of the implementation of public health rules, there is a general climate of civility in this community. However, the longer we go on without considering additional factors, uh, such as consistency and attention to opening up various parts of our activities safely, this civility may become a thing of the past, much like walking around without masks. I pray that we do not get to that point. The cry for help, which this legislation suggests is stronger than the legal basis for its enactment. In that sense, this legislation has already had an impact on all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Underwood. I'd like to acknowledge the, president, the presence of uh, our Director of Public Health, uh, Mr. Arts and Augustine, uh, along with the uh, directors. Uh, director St. Augustine, you are, you are I, I can't hear you yet, Art. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Chairman. Uh, there you go. Good afternoon. Thank okay, you. that's Director, I can't hear you again. Hey, Madam Chair, I'm here. Can there, you hear me? There you are. Okay, okay. please begin again. Yes. Oh, actually, uh, Madam Chair, our Deputy Director uh, is going to speak on to the bill. Yeah. Okay, so, great. Uh, okay. Half, half a day and good morning, uh, everyone, uh, or good afternoon at this point. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties during our last uh, uh, hearing and so we've kind of broken it down and uh, we're going to try and proceed the best we can. If we lose anyone or if you lose us, just let us know. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying I am Terry Uggen, uh, Deputy Director of Department of Public Health and just listening to the testimonies that have taken place so far, of course, you know, I'm deeply touched and uh, coming from a family that's very religious uh, and faith-based and uh, strives uh, to maintain, to uphold that. Uh, these conversations are, are very important. So I'd like to definitely acknowledge the Archbishop uh, and his testimony earlier. You know, the people of Guam have a long history of having their liberties at some level stripped from them. My grandparents, my father's generation, especially during World War II. It's true, again, we are fighting a war, a pandemic, and it too has casualties. Um, but unlike our previous World War II and our war that we've been in, that there are certain liberties that we are trying to restore back to the people uh, by opening up more and more, trying to find that new normal that is out there. It is imperative that collectively we do all that we can to safeguard the lives of Guam community by basic messaging and practices, properly wearing face coverings, properly hand sanitizing, staying at home as much as possible. Uh, and of course, if you have any symptoms to make sure that you reach out to your physician. We also know too that as we move forward uh, trying to open up more facilities and stores, of course, churches as well, that though we are reminded about how the 
COVID virus is spread from person to person. Um, no matter how we look at it, we're still looking at enclosed spaces uh, where air condition allows uh, air to, to recycle and move around the room. Uh, we're also talking about a collection of all ages of people coming together. And even at 25% of capacity, um, in looking at the 15 minute guidelines by CDC, we're looking at people that are coming together for usually 30 minutes or more, uh, and sometimes as much as an hour. Uh, the something, this, the simple gesture or holding, I hate to say a, a missilet or even touching the pews is a way in which uh, the virus can be spread from person to person. And simply that acknowledgement that a person can do in recognizing uh, their elders um, is an easy way of transmission. Um, there is a lot of balance that we've talked about previously. Balance, we're trying to find that, that new normal, that new level of lifestyle that allows people to exercise their liberties at some level, and at the same time safeguarding uh, the valuable lives of our, our children, our mononko, and as we all know, with the different ages of the people that have passed away, that really this virus can 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 kill people of all ages. Um, our data doesn't lie in the number of new infections. Our data doesn't lie in the numbers of deaths that we've had. Um, so I'm very interested and very eager to hear the rest of the testimonies that take place today and in wanting to make sure that, um, that we take a very close look at this uh, and hear what what people have, have to share. So thank you very much. Uh, once more, I'm Terry Uggen. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, Deputy Director Uggen. And thank you, Deputy Director Duenas for also being here. And to the Director, of course, of Department of Public Health and Social Services. All right, uh, we have a, a couple more people signed up to testify. Um, it would be Polly Mike, then Ron Laguatnia, and then Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero. Uh, so Polly Mike, if you are here. Yeah, yeah good afternoon. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and um, half a day to everyone. Just to echo the Archbishop's um, words as well, um, in, in partnership with the government, we with full intentions of cooperation, um, we entered this and we were very fortunate and blessed to be partners in this endeavor. But throughout the, the, the whole experience, and I, I can give you firsthand experience of this, and I thought we really were partners in all of this. And in, the goal was to secure the safety of our people, to ensure that this pandemic does not explode even further. And then when the closure and the executive orders came out with the closure of churches, that, that hit home very, very hard. And it, it, it sent a clear message that we were no longer partners and that um, we were subservient to that, um, the higher power, I guess, if you will. Um, and I know, I know the difficulties it is, I don't have the answers either, but if anything that this bill provides is, is what former Congressman Underwood provided was awareness and um, continued outreach. I think people need to be educated as well. And I think that if you and I continue to dialogue and be able to provide this type of venue to our people, um, it'll go a long way. I just wanna point out one thing, especially in terms of our, our sick, um, especially those at GMH, those who are isolated, those who are quarantined, they are unable to be visited by anyone, not even their families, let alone uh, a religious minister. But in that experience of, of that opportunity and hearing from patients who have been there, um, the fear continues to grow and it continues to be um, harvested there in those, in those institutions of health. Fear can be replaced with faith. And I think if you and I can acknowledge that, that faith does heal. And many of our people who are in there look towards a higher power, whether it be a Christian God, whether it be a God that we believe in as, as one, it certainly has been proven that faith heals. And if we can only bring that component into our discussion um, and, and into, the, into the pandemic review plan, I, I think we, we, we would have much more success. 
And so I, I just want to, again, reiterate that, that do not discount our faith groups. Our, our faith groups are very powerful. Um, we're, we're here. Our goal is to, to help our people. And then we want to have responsible worship, as, as the Archbishop has mentioned. Uh, we've been very disciplined in our protocols. And in fact, now we have a group of, of individuals from the Archdiocese that are being trained to be contact tracers. And so that in the event of any of our churches or schools, um, anyone tests positive, that um, is not to take the place of public health officials, but it's to work in, in tangent with them and to work in partnership with, with them. So I hope that this bill would, would open the eyes and the ears and the hearts of all the leaders, the political leaders that be, so that we can continue to work together and, and don't discount anyone in the community. Um, we, we're all here to help each other and we're all here as one goal is to help a better Guam and to build a better Guam. Thank you. Thank you, Polly Mike. I'd like to uh, state for the record that that's Father Michael Chrysostomo, vicar for the clergy of the Archdiocese of Hagatnya, Sisus Masi. We'll now recognize uh, Mr. Ron Laguatnya. Um, Congressman Robert Underwood. Will Castro. Then um, then a um, a so much on the kitchen and lies is in the door, Luis Munia, just Marcy and Nanaya and Stena Potaneda. Then Paratodi, Mansinidora, then Mansinidor, then the Manotai Publico Guinea Government and the Magagi Pop. And I would like to just thank you for allowing me the opportunity, but I would just like to get to the to what brought my attention to this to this bill, which was I read in the print media. Particularly on the, my name is Ronald T. Lagwanya, and I would like to um, support this bill, 382-35. And most in particular, what brought to my attention was um, the intent of the list of Turanguahan to protect the basic rights of residents during the declaration of public health emergency. That was in line 23 and 24 and particularly in line number 17F, which is, which will impose excessive fines. And I would like to um, just um, ask for clarity. Now with this uh, proposed legislation, does this uh, apply towards the public entities? Uh, in times of hardships, where currently there are 30,000 unemployed people right now. And that's what brought to my attention is the uh, ex imposing excessive fines and more in clarity, uh, if you can um, elaborate, would the, would the private sector be um, um, liable in, the, in these, uh, the intent, because it's very uh, general. And I, I think I did, uh, this is one, what I'm referring to is for, um, through um, some of the people that are living in housing units that during times of hardships, you know, they are being imposed of late fees, common area fees, parking fees, late fees during times of a pandemic such as this. And, and I'm just concerned that um, because there is and there are instances where they are imposing such late charges and fines for not paying up on time. So, you know, during times of hardship. So I'm not sure if this legislation applies to that because it looked like it was basically governmental and they have uh, for clarity purposes. And um, I just would like to know if that's, uh, would that not be limited to condominium homeowners associations, uh, apartment landlords and all housing unit owners that can impose such a, uh, hardships on uh, uh, such fees and fines or for our people currently, you know, struggling right now. So that's, that's what my, um, I would like to get some clarification on that. 
Right. Thank you, Mr. Laguanya. If that concludes your testimony, we will um, uh, allow all the testimony. And then, of course, the sponsor will have an opportunity to uh, address any concerns at her discretion. Um, we'll now proceed with Mr. Ken Younger. You're recognized. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Ken Leon Guerrero, and I have issues with this bill. On one hand, it recognizes that we have civil rights under the United States Constitution. And then on the other hand, it creates a useless body of law that will not be supported or enforced by any agency of government of Guam. I say that as probably the only person on this panel here that has stood up during the pandemic to defend our civil rights back when the governor did her partial roadblocks. Um, the biggest problem I have with this bill is that it wasn't introduced in the March emergency special session to deal with the pandemic issues. Uh, I'm also concerned that this bill does nothing to uh, limit the governor's unrestricted emergency powers to 30 days with exceptions subject to legislative approval. I'm also concerned that this bill does nothing to mandate legislature approval of expenditure of federal funds in the event of a future uh, uh, emergency and pandemic or any other uh, emerg federal emergency bailouts. The fact this bill changes an offense from a misdemeanor to a civil violation is kind of problematic too. What is a civil violation? I looked through all Guam code annotated to find a definition, couldn't find it. I'm sure an attorney will find one and send it to me, but it's not easy to find. There's no dis definition about who has the ability to uh, cite someone for a civil violation. There's no uh, appeal for a civil violation. And that is, that is a big problem. About the only part of the bill that actually makes sense is section um, 19406D, which prohibits seizure of private property without compensation, an act that has happened many times during this pandemic. We have 35,000 people out of work. Our tourism industry is shut down for years. It'll take years to get back to its normal levels. Every day, more small businesses close their doors forever. Our children have lost a year of education and development. Hundreds of people wait in food lines and hope they get to the front of the line before the food runs out. And we're losing our younger people and our older residents who are leaving Guam, moving to other places in the mainland for better opportunities and a better quality of life. This bill does nothing to protect the people of Guam during a pandemic situation. The time spent putting together this bill would have been better addressed, would have been better if it addressed the challenges that our people are going to be facing over the next year with the expiration of the federal unemployment insurance at the end of this year, the expiration of the SNAP uh, pandemic funding and uh, expiration of the relaxed requirements for application on SNAP. Uh, the expiration of the federal moratorium on eviction and foreclosures. These are going to leave hundreds of families homeless, but this legislature isn't addressing that. So we have a bigger problem. The bigger problem is leadership. And I'll, I'll show you an example. I have been, this is, uh, I guess you can't see it, but this is the uh, COVID tracker that Public Works is issued, uh, public health is issued. I have it, a few of my friends and family have it, but just about every single person I talk to doesn't have it. And according to public health statistics, we got 21 people here. At best, probably two or three people have downloaded the, the tracker. And it goes back even further because for since 2012, 2013, I've been a member of the Guam Non-Communicable Disease Consortium, which is a group of two to 300 people who have been working together to try to make Guam a healthier place. Because as we look at the ravages COVID has hit our island with, it's hitting hardest our elderly 
and our people with chronic diseases. Public health is the real thing we should be talking about here because public health has been handicapped in their mission to improve public health. Go to any of the facilities and you can see how run down they are. I remember taking people down to Inarahan um, uh, Public Health Center to help them apply for benefits and they couldn't get upstairs because the elevators weren't working. The people had to actually come downstairs to take the applications because the people couldn't get upstairs. Look at Manilo. The main public health building is sitting there empty and you know de decaying rapidly due to in use, all because public health didn't have the funds to properly maintain their building. And I'm not blaming public health. If they have a choice of you know, um, doing something to help people or uh, hiring electricians to come in and test circuits. It's obvious where public health money is going to go. What we have here is a question of priorities. This bill doesn't make anything a priority for the benefit of the people of Guam in face of the challenges that we're, we're going to be facing in the very short time ahead of us. So, all I can say about this bill is it was a waste of time. It was a waste of precious time because we don't get this time back. We've spent eight months and $1.6 billion. And what have we got to show for it? We've got a population that doesn't trust the government more than ever before as a result of the actions that Adeloup favoring politically well-connected insiders and the inactions of the legislature to hold Adeloup accountable for the monies they've received and the actions they've taken. It's no wonder that nobody's, you know, putting these, uh, downloading this very simple and valuable tool that could help public health in its mission. So what we need to do is we need to see our leaders act more like leaders and start putting the, the needs and concerns of the people first. When the people see and feel that, then we won't need laws like this for to ensure compliance with orders that were issued for the benefit of everyone. But we don't see it that way right now. That Thank you, Mr. Yonker. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we've exhausted the list of those who've signed up to testify. So I will now uh, yield to Senator Luis Munoz, who is the sponsor of the bill for questioning by uh, the pen. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm willing to open it up to the rest of the colleagues and I can just ask the questions at the end or, or answer some of the questions at the end if they have any other questions. But. Uh, I can take care of all of that in my closing. All right, thank you, Senator. Uh, my Vice Chair, Senator Sabina Paris. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate all those that have taken their time to provide testimony and making a very important contribution to this, um, this dialogue. You know, we are living in unprecedented times and this pandemic has truly tested our ability to adapt and respond. And it's, comfort it's comforting to hear uh, that there is a willingness to collaborate between Department of Public Health and the Archdiocese. Uh, so that is very positive. Um, but if I could just put a plug in regards to a piece of legislation that I also introduced that would address some of the underlying fears and concerns that our community is facing. Um, there is a Bill 386, uh, which addresses um, the emergency health powers. And um, uh, part of it was to close the gaps in procurement uh, law that was uh, that was uh, highlighted in the quarantine facility oversight. But this, I would just like to point um, the attention uh, to 